Uh, good evening. My name is Geoffrey Bennett. I'm the director of the University of Notre Dame's uh, London Law Programme, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. Um, this event is the product of a fruitful partnership between the University of Notre Dame and the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre. Uh, it's also the latest in a series of discussions uh, like this, which considered various human rights related uh, topics, both recently human rights and cyberspace. Uh, and we're planning more such events uh, as this in the very near future. And we have a Notre Dame uh, London webpage where we will in due course uh, publicize these events and we look forward to seeing um, more of you then. Um, I know that time is at a premium, so let me now hand you over to Phil Bloomer, who is the Executive Director of the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre. Yeah, we're here, in case you didn't know, to debate the, uh, to debate the motion that does the world need a, a treaty on business and human rights. Um, the International Business Treaty is now a significant debate in Geneva, having been raised by Ecuador and, the, uh, and supporting states. It's also one that has tremendous controversy around it. Tr controversy because the guiding principles are out there, they've been out there uh, only three years. There's a sense of clear frustration around the issue as to whether the guiding uh, principles are actually delivering, particularly on remedy uh, for victims and the vulnerable, and the protection of the vulnerable. And so these are some of the topics that are going to be uh, debated tonight, um, and which I hope there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers and comments from the, from the floor. We have a stellar list of speakers, which you all have a note on in, in front of you. Um, they've all got razor-sharp minds, but they've all also assured me that they're extraordinarily disciplined in time. Um, and as the chair, of course, I will be the chief uh, moderator, uh, a.k.a. enforcer. Uh, but that also is to make sure that we've got time for you to be able to make your contributions and your questions and answers, all of which will be as crisp and concise, of course, as the speakers themselves. So without further ado, I'm going to pass on to uh, Professor Doug Cassell from Notre Dame University, uh, the Professor of Law, who is also specialised uh, for many years in business and human rights. Thank you very much, Phil, and thank you all for coming out here this evening. There was a time when human rights were thought to limit the power only of states. No more. Globalization has accelerated the spread of transnational companies into faraway places where gross violations of human rights are endemic. A pair of contrasting examples illustrates the consequences. Two decades ago, I had the honor of assisting the United Nations Truth Commission for El Salvador. We investigated the Salvadoran army's massacre of peasants at a place called El Mosote, where the number of civilians killed, between 500 and 900 people, was the largest death toll of any single incident in that civil war. Now compare El Mosote to the collapse a year ago of an unsafe building at Rana Plaza in Bangladesh. The building was full of small garment factories where mostly young women worked. The death toll, 1,100 workers, surpassed El Mosote. Much responsibility belongs to the Bangladeshi government. It failed properly to inspect and shut down a death trap. But why were the workers inside a visibly unsafe building? Because they were producing clothes for Western retailers many of them based in your country and mine. Corrupt local business owners disregarded unsafe conditions, but the Western companies had not done enough to ensure that workers in their supply chain were safe. On the contrary, one company reportedly opposed a plan to make factories in Bangladesh safer on the ground that it was too expensive. And all companies pressured their Bangladeshi suppliers to produce clothing on tight schedules with little honest profit margin. If such cases are now more numerous, they are not new. In the 1970s, both the OECD, the Organization of the World's Wealthy Nations, and the International Labor Organization issued non-binding guidelines for states to require multinational enterprises to protect basic rights of workers. In 2000, the UN established its Global Compact, 
by which thousands of companies commit to respect for human rights and worker rights. But these and many other so-called soft law or voluntary initiatives are not legally binding. They have no enforcement procedures, generally speaking, beyond reporting and toothless dispute resolution mechanisms. Collectively, they may help to change corporate culture and improve practice. But as illustrated by Rana Plaza, they are a step too short. Recognizing this, the UN Subcommission on Human Rights in 2003 issued a set of norms on the human rights responsibilities of transnational corporations and other businesses. The norms had much good content, but they asserted with scant foundation in law that existing human rights treaties that bind states also already bind business as well. And they set up vague standards backed by potentially severe penalties for businesses that transgress them. Many NGOs supported the norms, but the norms attracted support from few businesses and even fewer states. The UN Commission on Human Rights declared that the norms had, quote, no legal standing, unquote, and forbade the subcommission from monitoring their implementation. The controversy over the norms did, however, prod the UN to put business and human rights on its agenda. In 2005, the UN appointed John Ruggie, a professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and a close advisor to Kofi Annan as its special expert on business and human rights. In 2008, Mr. Ruggie proposed and the UN Human Rights Council welcomed his three pillar framework of protect, respect, and remedy. Under the first pillar, states have a duty to protect human rights, including from violations by business. Under the second pillar, business has a duty to respect human rights. This means adopting written human rights policies, implementing them throughout the company, and exercising due diligence to anticipate and avoid or mitigate risks to human rights arising from the activities of the business. And under the third pillar, both states and business have a duty to remedy human rights violations when they arise. In 2011, Professor Ruggie expanded his three-pillar framework into a set of guiding principles supplemented by his commentary. But he made clear that the principles were not legally binding. They are instead a set of societal expectations for business. The Human Rights Council, acting by consensus with no dissent, quote, endorsed, unquote, his guiding principles. So they're now the UN guiding principles. The Council also established a five-member working group to promote the implementation of the guiding principles. We are graced tonight by the presence of Professor Michael Addo, who will be speaking later and is a member of the working group. However, some states and NGOs argue that the guiding principles are too vague and too little enforced to be effective. Last September, Ecuador introduced a proposal before the UN Human Rights Council formally supported by over 80 countries to study the possibility of a legally binding treaty on business and human rights. We welcome the presence here this evening of Maria Eugenia Aviles, the first secretary of the Embassy of Ecuador. Welcome, bienvenida. More than 100 NGOs, in fact, many more than that, have endorsed Ecuador's proposal. This March, Ecuador sponsored a seminar on its proposal as a side event to the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. A number of governments spoke from the floor. Most were non-committal. By my count, only Ecuador, Bolivia, and Cuba clearly supported the proposal. The UK, I believe, was the only government to make clear that it opposes the proposal. The UK says it would rather focus on implementing the UN guiding, guiding principles. As for my country, the US, it hid under the table and said nothing. <laughs> Among human rights advocates, there is a debate over Ecuador's proposal. We will shortly hear more from Chip Pitts, to my right, as a proponent, and Chris Esdale, three seats down, as a skeptic. There are a number of points to be made on each side. But in large part, just speaking personally, it seems to me that much of the debate comes down to two bodies of thought. 
One believes that the UN guidings, guiding principles are and will remain far too little. They believe that only a binding treaty can get the job done. The opposing school argues that the guiding principles are making a positive contribution and can achieve much more if properly tended. A treaty, they say, will take years to negotiate and in the end likely attract few states' parties. Meanwhile, the very pursuit of a treaty, they argue, may distract all concerned from implementing the guidelines which can bring more immediate benefits. In principle, of course, there is no necessary inconsistency between doing both. The guiding principles can do their work in shaping business attitudes and practice. A treaty could do its work by supp supplying useful incentives and more effective enforcement. Advocates on both sides publicly endorse this view. But tensions remain. At the very least, questions arise about which approach deserves more emphasis and by whom and when. One difficulty in all of this is that we don't know what sort of treaty we're talking about. What human rights will it cover? What businesses will it cover? Will home states have responsibilities for the activities of their companies in other states? What sort of enforcement mechanisms would there be? Will they be limited to reporting mechanisms or include civil or even criminal sanctions? Will the enforcement mechanisms be at the state level, in national courts, or at the international level through a treaty committee or some sort of international court? And there are many other questions of this nature. We are not here tonight to resolve this debate, but we do hope to cast a bit of light on it. And we thank you all for joining us in this modest aspiration. Thank you. There are indeed, as Professor Castle said, many, many questions, many practical issues uh, surrounding the question tonight. But for the moment, I'm going to put those aside and take the position that the answer to the question is yes, the world does need a treaty on business and human rights. We have one against bribery and corruption. Isn't human rights at least as important? Especially when, as the center's website shows, most human rights abuses by business completely escape any kind of accountability. As a former international business lawyer who knows the good that businesses can do for jobs and technology, as well as other human rights, I won't elaborate on those. But I also saw that businesses had rights under international law, intellectual property rights, investor protection rights, whereas the victims of human rights violations have no effective remedies in those international investment treaties, bilateral free trade treaties, regional free trade, multilateral free trade. And they, businesses have few, if any, duties or liabilities. I even help clients draft labor and other uh, provisions to try to put in these treaties that would often not get in there. But the treaties themselves typically don't have protections for victims. That imbalance needs to be corrected. If these important international economic instruments don't have any protection for victims of human rights, they don't allow the victims to have standing in the arbitral tribunals, that's like business saying, when I'm the soccer goalie, I get protective equipment and you don't. <laughs> or if you're boxing, you know, I get to wear the, uh, you don't have the right to wear gloves, but when I'm boxing, I take the gloves off. That's just not right. It's not fair. And we need to remedy that imbalance in international law. As they'd say in this country, sorry, old chap, that's just not sporting, you know. <laughs> this, this, thank you. I'm trying to at least have one thing. You only give me 10 minutes for that. This imbalance isn't good for businesses either, or states, especially in our uber-transparent world today. Both of them continue to suffer very significant trust deficits. It's especially bad for human rights victims. Now, I'm going to list some of the reasons that I think that the right treaty would be in the interest of businesses and states, as well as victims. They would confirm that the operations of business are under the rule of law. They would shore up and level the global regulatory playing field at a higher and more consistent level. They would advance stability and legal predictability for businesses. And again, as a former general counsel of a couple of businesses, I know that's very important, for ensuring compliance and adequate risk management to protect the businesses from financial and reputational and even legal risk. They would decrease at the extremes extremely expensive violent protests even, or protests in general that can stop projects in their tracks. And at the extremes, again, lead to even crime and, and terrorism, as we've seen some businesses globally experience. They would potentially enhance, protect, protect state and business reputations. 
A treaty could strengthen enforcement and effective and global and domestic remedies against businesses that are competing unfairly because they're using social dumping, abusing human rights to get unfair competitive advantage. Uh, a treaty, the right treaty, would preserve the coherence and integrity of the global business and human rights systems, which are now at risk, as we've seen with the recurring financial crises and questions about whether globalization can be ethical and, and be fair. The accountability gaps have largely remained, despite business ethics, despite soft laws, despite all the voluntary initiatives, many of which we have, indicated by growing civil society discontent and large NGO to partners, such as Global Witness leaving the Kimberley process or Amnesty International leaving the voluntary principles on security. Now, the 2011 guiding principles, I'll call them the GPs, are a uniquely important, broad, and authoritative soft law effort because of the unanimous uh, approval by the UN Human Rights Council and by the adoption by other important standards bodies, the International Standards Organization, the IFC, the OECD guidelines. And times have changed. That's something to keep in mind here. But again, as a former outside counsel to companies, chief legal officer of a major multinational, and general counsel, then CEO, CEO of startup companies, I'll tell you there is a difference between hard law and soft law. You know, soft law is much easier to ignore or circumvent. The executives say, what's the loophole? How can I get around it? That's not really binding, is it? Whereas hard law all of a sudden gives the general counsel or the CEO of a company and the C-suite team a club, and they say, this is a real compliance matter. We don't have the discretion. This is not negotiable. And human rights should not be negotiable. As we've seen with the anti-bribery acts, I've had personal experience both advising companies and helping companies comply from inside with the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which then led to the, uh, the OEC convention and then the UN convention on anti-corruption. That's, that hard law is an invaluable aid to truly achieving compliance and effectively managing risk. Now, victims' needs are also very urgent. And it's a, even if we had a wonderful treaty, neither the treaty nor the guiding principles are a panacea. The GPs and many other soft and hard law efforts are increasingly converging, and I would argue they're largely complementary. The same rights are often addressed, and there's a recognition that all rights can be abused by businesses, all businesses, not just transnationals. I've even written that I think this is a new type of global customary international law, that it's a general principle of international law under the sources of law under the ICG statute. This would require us to transcend the old formalistic way of thinking and recognize that law must conform to the reality of the world today, where businesses often dwarf the power of states and, and the resources that certain states have. Um, a hard law treaty succeeding a soft law instrument is an absolutely normal process in international law generally and in human rights in particular. It happened to the UDHR, the Universal Declaration itself, as well as in the anti-corruption, many, many other contexts. So since treaty discussions will take a long time, arguably it's important to start talking about the complex issues now, sooner rather than later. And yet, hard law accountability, although you know, I've, I've got a textbook on it, and it's a fascinating thing, the way it really has emerged. The prospect and sometimes the reality of hard law accountability is, re is real. But it does remain inconsistent. And in those limited cases where it has been effective, um, you know, they're, they're very limited and patchy. A French court last year in the Alstom case held that contrary to the guiding principles but also the views of international scholars, companies could not be liable under international humanitarian law for even violations of the strongest norms, international crimes and use Kogan's norms, which uh, would include the grave abuses of the Geneva Conventions, for example. And despite the successes using tort law in some jurisdictions like the UK, as Chris and his firm has done, or criminal law in other jurisdictions, Corporate liability for serious human rights and humanitarian abuses has been questioned. For example, in my own company, famously the Second Circuit's decision in Kiabel said that corporations cannot even be liable under any circumstances under international law. The Supreme Court did not accept that as the ground, but they dismissed the case on other grounds, the extraterritorial ground. The existence of a treaty, however, often decisively helps. Local incorporation at the domestic state level of the Rome Treaty on the International Court created corporate criminal liability for those gross abuses in some jurisdictions that already accepted that corporations could be guilty of crimes, um, even though the treaty itself didn't include corporations. Similarly, conventions like the Basel Convention on Disposal of Toxic Waste led first the EU and then the Netherlands to enact legislation under which the toxic waste dumping in the famous Trafigura case, or infamous Trafigura case, was prosecuted to successful settlement. 
So the expressive value of a treaty, its signaling effect, its education effect, and its influence on domestic law reform and for educating people, changing behavior, changing values and culture is extremely important. Many courts, the courts in India, for example, not a monist jurisdiction that accepts international law directly, but they often will look to what treaties say and they apply them, you know, just as a matter of course. And in monist jurisdictions like the Netherlands, you can enforce rights more directly. Same thing, arguably, in theory, at least with certain Latin American jurisdictions. So preserving G implement, GP implementation is a very important concern, going to matters of content, scope, process, or timing, which I won't get into. But the GPs were supposed to be the floor, and they've been treated by some states so far as a ceiling. Any treaty process must complement and not um, undermine, either in, um, in intent or in action, the GPs. Um, it would be very good, in fact, I think, if we could have a treaty that builds on the GPs, takes their floor as a, a baseline, and then genuinely improves them. But, of course, the improvements in the eyes of some diplomats aren't improvements in the eyes of other diplomats. But it is important that a treaty embrace the evolving, for example, recognition in international law that states have extraterritorial obligations and that universal jurisdiction for international crimes, gross abuses, is preserved. And that where the forum, there's no forum available, the forum necessitatis, necessitatis convention, that, that principle is preserved so that you have a forum for remedy. Um, even a few states reliably acceding to that extraterritorial notion, for example, could change accountability in a positive direction dramatically. A lot of great treaties start small with just a few states, like the Geneva Conventions themselves, the Ottawa Landmines Convention, and others. So not only is there no contradiction between the GPs on one hand and a treaty on the other, as John Ruggie has repeatedly emphasized, a treaty is arguably required by the state duty to protect, read with the requirement of effective remedies and given the continued impunity of businesses in most human rights cases. The GPs were adopted without, refer without prejudice to a treaty, and John Ruggie himself did call for a treaty when the human rights system doesn't apply, as in, effectively, as in conflict situations. Well, the human rights system for businesses is not applying very many places in the world at, at large. So Professor Ruggie has urged a targeted treaty, perhaps like the UN Convention on Corruption, but now he's expressed concerns about the complexity of the process, about whether a treaty body could deal with the large number of multinationals. I actually think that if there were a lot of complaints from multinationals, that's perhaps a reason to have a treaty instead of not having a treaty. And lots of treaty bodies have already started to deal with this issue, the ESCR Covenant Treaty Committee and the Rights of the Child, uh, Child Treaty and so forth. So this conversation is going on. A lot of states have started it. We can't say, no, you can't have freedom of speech. That would not be consistent with human rights. We can't do that. Um, however, as we go ahead with treaty options, I'd like to suggest three things to keep in mind. The process, the treaty, the terms of reference should build on, not retreat from the guiding principles. It should be evidence-based, not an anti-ideological or political exercise against wealthy northern states or TNCs only. It should employ, thirdly, a careful and deliberate multi-stakeholder process that involves civil society, businesses as well as, as NGOs and states, to build consensus for the right treaty, which should take time. The final comment I'll make is that states can and should show leadership by enacting firmer laws now. It's true that there's nothing stopping them, and they're obligated under the state duty to protect, to improve laws and enforcement where gaps exist. That's guiding principle three. And yet, I don't think that that's a reason to say a treaty would add little value. This is a collective action problem, even though some people have said it's not. The reality is that there are lots of reasons states will not enact tougher laws or enforcement in the absence of a treaty. Um, sometimes it's the lack of resources and the international cooperation that's provided for in many treaties. Sometimes it's corruption. Sometimes it's other priorities. Sometimes and often it's fears that they'll lose foreign direct investment. And so we've got to handle those collective action problems. We know that the solution to collective action problems in general are firmer, clearer, even more authoritative norms than something like a voluntary initiative or a soft law norm. And we know that the other piece of the, the solution to collective action problems is stronger enforcement. And the states can and should show good faith, even before the treaty negotiation, I would say, whether it's wealthier states or developing states, by stepping up to the plate and enacting those reforms right now. Thank you. Um, 
I think the, the chip sets out very nicely um, the range of, of issues that we want to be talking about tonight. Um, I just want to comment really on a couple of points. Uh, the first is, while CHIP does signal at certain points some real abuses, like, for example, the whole imbalance between protection for businesses on the one hand and lack of protection for victims on the other, um, we have to ask the question, why do we need a treaty to deal with this? But furthermore, not just any treaty, we need to have a treaty that is sufficiently comprehensive, wide enough, to actually cover the full range of activity that comes under the, the, the label business. And this is actually the point of entry for John Ruggie. And if you've looked at his interventions against the idea of a treaty right away, at least, see that he picks up precisely on the fact that business is an umbrella term it covers activities controlled by, as he points out, invest investment law, trade law, company law, labor law, and of course, human rights law. Now, the uh, Ruggie uses this distinction, or these, these, these dis different categories, just to argue that this is too disparate a set of activities to be brought under the mantle of a single treaty, and that therefore, we want to uh, be cautious and let these uh, separate domains, each intersecting with the human right, to find their feet before we launch ourselves into something more ambitious, which is the kind of treaty uh, he's talking about. Consider the opposite possibility. It may well be that time is not on the side of the guiding principles, but working against them. And it may be a problem that a treaty of the comprehensive sort I'm talking about can remedy. How so? Well, each, as you see, the domain of the law, investment, trade, etc., that we want to come under uh, the guiding principles, intersects with human rights. But at the same time, each of those domains shapes the human rights in question. It assigns them a particular weight as they compete with commercial interests, for example. And so we find that we, we see something that can startle a human rights specialist, which is that when a human right is brought on board and competes with, say, the objectives of an investment treaty to see investment penetrate uh, barriers, uh, national barriers, or trade, same thing, what it sees is that insofar as we allow these human rights to enter in, they are under the condition that they have to do least damage to the commercial interest in question. Find the constant thing we heard from, the theme we hear from the um, WTO panels, find a way of implementing a reason for not the importing that can include a human rights reason that'll do the least damage to trade interests. Now that'll shock a human rights lawyer because if you look at the way human rights treaties are written, it goes in the opposite direction. You must respect the human right, and if so far as you pay attention to competing reasons, competing interests, they must do least damage to the human right in question. You have the opposite way of reasoning. Now, the problem is that allowing over time each of these domains to build up their own picture of human rights fragments and weakens the type of human right that we want to see govern business. And I'm not making special pleadings for a type of human right. I'm simply saying, if you take some human rights the way they're meant to be taken, your starting point has to be precisely the way the human rights community understands those rights. Well, as I say, time I don't think is on the side of the guiding principles in this way, because at the moment, the approach of allowing human rights to take their shape in these different domains will ultimately fragment and weaken this linkage we're looking for. A treaty can do a great deal to bring coherence and to bring um, some kind of real respect for human rights that we won't get otherwise. Of course, that doesn't mean that the treaty will enter into the kinds of full detail 
that um, people all, all often think would be the problem if you tried with a treaty to govern this range of, of issues. No, we are very familiar with treaties that operate at a very general level and then fill in the blanks with general comments in the um, case of the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights through to the jurisprudence of either arbitral bodies or others that are talked about as possible uh, human rights courts. All that is possible, but only if you've got the bedrock of a general commitment forcing a coherent picture of real respect for human rights you won't get it without a treaty. Thank you. So does the world need a treaty on business and human rights? I've been billed as the sceptic in, uh, in this debate. But in fact, I'm not in the least bit sceptical about the need for legal accountability for human rights abuses by business, by transnational corporations or other business entities. In fact, I think it's a key challenge for the global human rights system. My scepticism derives from the fact that I'm not sure that this is the best way forward at the moment, and I'm not sure that it's achievable in the form that we need it to be. So what I'm going to do is touch a little bit on the position of companies and states in the debate. Then I'm going to look at a little bit about what might happen if there was a treaty negotiation process, and finally, I'm going to put forward a couple of suggestions as to alternative ways forward. So first of all, companies. We know that responsible companies engage. They engage with corporate social responsibility initiatives. The best of them, the most responsible of them, engage increasingly with human rights obligations and the discourse that comes with that. But many do not. What do we do? about those who don't, for example, have the reputational damage to consider, perhaps those that are not household names, those whose activities are way out of the spotlight, that are far away in little corners of the world, those who are disinterested in corporate social responsibilities or the guiding principles. We remember that when the UN norms were um, initiated in 2003 that um, Professor Cassell referred to, most business was hostile at that stage. I wonder what has changed since then. What has changed regarding the prospect of binding rules? Why do we suddenly think that um, the companies are going to be in favour of this kind of treaty? Secondly, states. The recent call that was made for the treaty was signed up to by around 80 states, which is a significant number. But I do wonder how those states would respond to the heavy lobbying that would undoubtedly take place against the treaty, not least by companies operating in their own jurisdictions. It's perhaps an obvious point, but the resource-rich the resource but low-income states are first of all often reluctant to upset companies who are investing heavily in their countries. And secondly, they often are themselves the ones that lack the effective systems and institutions to prevent or remedy human rights abuses. And we remember too that most of the governments were also largely negative to the UN norms in 2003. <coughs> Low-income countries didn't want intrusive regulations. They didn't want to upset big companies that were investing in their, in their jurisdictions. And developed states felt that the norms were unnecessary or excessive and that they would upset the big business who had their headquarters there. So what has changed? And we should not, I would suggest, misinterpret the unanimous um, Human Rights Council support for the voluntary, non-binding UN guiding principles. This, in my opinion, does not imply their support necessarily for binding rules. Thirdly, what will happen if a treaty negotiation process is tried? Chip has referred to the problems of getting the right treaty, and I think that's the problem. The aspirations of some states and some NGOs are, in my opinion, very unlikely to survive a treaty negotiation process in anything like the form that's been proposed. 
Much is likely to be lost in such a process. Let me give a couple of examples. Time doesn't allow me to go through very many, but let me give you a couple. What kind of rights would be included in such a treaty? The UN norms were based on around 56 sets of varying types of rules. They were widely criticised for being too complex and self-referential. Indeed, one commentator referred to the, to the self-generating normative cannibalism of the UN norms. The NGOs that have recently called for the treaty um, have called for, quote, obligations in relation to human rights violations, economic and ecological crimes and abuses, unquote. In my opinion, big business is highly unlikely to welcome any obligations in the field of economic, social and cultural rights, despite them being an integral part of the guiding principles. Arguably, a treaty based on civil and political rights is not enough. It must extend to economic and social rights. And some commentators from the Global South say that the process ought to take, in count, take into account the kind of trade disparities that exist between the Global South and the Global North, and the spectre of poverty as well. The other problem, as an example, is that I'm not sure that many states would want to ratify such a treaty. Unfortunately, um, uh, Chip and Professor Cassell's um, home country ha has, doesn't have the best uh, record <laughs> of ratifying international treaties. I'm sure that you're all well aware that they share the dubious privilege of not having ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child with Somalia and South Sudan. And South Sudan hasn't been around very long. <laughs> but, the, but the US was particularly hostile to the UN norms when they were put forward. And that has to be recognised. So we may run the risk that a treaty negotiation process provides us with a watered down set of rules with few ratifications and it creates rather a lot of hostility and may leave us in no better position than we are now. Fourthly, what could we suggest as an alternative? Let's bear in mind that the global human rights movement is only about 60 years old. It's a work in progress. It was largely designed to protect individuals against abuses by the state. It was never designed to cope with protecting individuals from violations on the part of non-state entities. It's not perfect. And remedies and enforcement, one of the key aims of the calls for the treaty, are still a particular problem in many of the international treaties that, that exist from that system. We need new responses. And I would argue that the guiding principles are not the sole answer. I think we have to harness the existing patchwork of rights and remedies at domestic and international um, levels and that we need to think creatively about how they can be used. Perhaps the Global South should drive efforts to harmonise legislation and remedies at domestic and international, uh, sorry, domestic and regional level. Perhaps the Global South should use its already existing excellent work on, um, on incorporating uh, innovative rights into their constitutions, such as has happened in Bolivia and Ecuador, for example, um, fairly recently, and create, if you like, legal facts on the ground. Perhaps these kind of rights should be embedded in regional human rights mechanisms. Those mechanisms generally have much less suspicion of economic, social and cultural rights than would um, the Human Rights Council at a global level. Perhaps there could be some initiatives um, emerging to allow funding for global access to justice schemes at a local regional level. These kind of ideas recognise, first of all, the difficulty of achieving global consensus, and secondly, they recognise the fact that the Global South is the most impacted by many of the uh, abuses that we are talking about. So in conclusion, I say rules, enforceable mechanisms, accessible remedies are desperately needed. But as someone 
recently cautioned us, quote, avoid going down a road that would end in largely symbolic gestures of little practical use to real people in real places and with a high potential for creating serious backlash against any form of further international legalization in this domain, unquote. John Ruggie said that. I'm not actually in the habit of agreeing very much with John Ruggie, <laughs> but on this occasion I do. I make a plea for accountability, not in favour of a treaty at any price. Thank you. I do think that the answer, I mean, there's not one single answer, first of all, but I do think that the, um, the way forward is not the negotiation of a um, overall business and human rights treaty. And I'll try to explain why, and I, I agree uh, with some of the points that were made, uh, that were made earlier. I think the way forward is to break down uh, business and human rights in the variety of areas that it actually covers, from investment law to world trade law to labor law and to um, other issues such as uh, human rights in conflict, in conflict zones, etc. I think all of these separate areas raise very distinct questions that need to be addressed in very distinct ways. I am concerned that um, by negotiating an overall business and human rights treaty, we would dilute uh, these areas into one big um, treaty that will necessarily be a compromise and will necessarily be less advanced than if we go ahead and move forward Breaking down, uh, breaking down the areas. I will take two examples uh, of, of what I mean. Um, if we go ahead and start to think about a business and human rights treaty, a variety of questions arise that I think have been mentioned already both by, by Chip and, and by Chris. It raises the question, which rights are we talking about? <coughs> Economic, social, cultural rights, civil and political rights, labor rights group rights. Um, it raises questions about will this treaty bind businesses? Will it bind also, sorry, will it bind states only or are we going to go down the route of saying that it also binds businesses with all the controversies that, that this idea actually has risen in the past and I believe continues to, to rise. Uh, very simply, what's a business? What do we consider to fall under the category of, of, of business. And in terms of contents, are we talking about a treaty that would involve quite traditionally, as in the UN system, reporting by states on how they're, going with their, how they're doing with their obligations? Or are we talking about a treaty that is going to encourage states to criminalize certain conducts or encourage states to legislate, to regulate businesses, to ask for more reporting, I mean, there's a variety of, of things that, that of, of areas that that treaty could actually cover. So in light of all this complexity, um, I think two areas could be pursued, uh, two areas could be looked at now that would make, uh, that would advance the debate on, on having binding norms on business and human rights. One of them would be to explore more seriously using the International Criminal Court as um, a venue, as an, uh, an avenue for uh, addressing the most <coughs> egregious violations that amount to international crimes. As you know, the International Criminal Court doesn't have jurisdiction over corporations, but it does have jurisdiction over individuals who can happen to be in the business world, so there's absolutely no contradiction there. I would also not dismiss the possibility of, of amending the ICC statute. I'm saying that in public, I can't believe it. But um, I mean, after all, frankly, I didn't think that the negotiations over the adoption of a definition of aggression were ever going to move forward, and yet now we have it. The statute of the ICC was amended. I don't see any reason why uh, we couldn't pursue that in the area of corporate responsibility. I do think it's a very soft spot and would be a very, perhaps much easier 
area to pursue because who's going to argue that it's an international crime to commit genocide if you're an individual, but somehow that's okay if you're a corporation. There's absolutely no logic there. And I think <coughs> it would be an easy err way of, of presenting it. So that would be one avenue. The second one, very quickly, for me, would be to pursue more actively, um, and I'm saying that we as business and human rights advocates in our various capacities, but one of, the, one of the avenues for me would be to pursue more actively work around the existing international human rights treaties, the, civil, the, the, the two covenants at the UN level, but also all the, um, all the specialized treaties at the United Nations level, but also at the regional levels, the European Convention, the African, the African Charter, etc. I think within these treaties, there is room for having more litigation and address the issue of states controlling what corporations do on their own territories. I know the idea of extraterritorial reach of these conventions is very controversial, and John <coughs> Ruggie has not been wanting to go all the way in the UN guiding principles. I think it's a bit of a shame, but at the same time, I understand why he, he made that decision. But even without going that far, if you look at the ratifications of all these treaties, there is definitely room for improvement in terms of forcing um, or encouraging states, rather, uh, to, um, to um, prevent human rights abuses by third parties, including businesses. So I do think there's more work to be done in that area. Um, and that um, that would be, for me, the way forward. In other words, I don't think that the UN guiding principles are the only instrument we have in business and human rights. We do have a pretty solid, legally speaking, human rights framework that can be used, that could be used more fully uh, without going the route of negotiating and starting from scratch in a way, negotiating an overall business and human rights treaty. Um, thank you very much, and I'm sure there'll be questions later. I'd like to thank you the, and your Business and Resource Centre. Thank Douglas in particular. This is the second time you've saved my life. Um, the first time being saved me from a rather tight corner in Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, thank the University of Notre Dame for, for having us here. Um, as a member of the working group, I exaggerate my position in thinking we having been given the mandate to implement the guiding principles, we obviously are wearing the crown uh, that has to deliver the guiding principles. And of course, um, as a distressed intern said to me after a similarly rigorous debate on something very similar, uh, do you feel that is worth staying on the working group? <laughs> uh, and uh, the answer, which of course surprised this intern, was that yes, I do. I think it's a very good idea to be on the working group, particularly with the support of contributions such as this, and of course the answer, but they seem to criticize the guiding principles all the time. Uh, yes, I think that sort of constructive criticism like we're having here is incredibly helpful, so I am immensely grateful. Now, for my reflections, I'm actually quite surprised that the debate was so mild. Um, <laughs> not, ju <laughs> not just that, but also I see that there is more that you agree, agree with than more uh, that divides you. There's uh, this concern about accountability, which you share, the need for corporate culture, change in corporate culture, which you share, uh, and the need to avoid adverse human rights impact, which you share. But of course, uh, one side wants it yesterday, and the other side wants to be a little bit more strategic. The important point, of course, is that the, point, the side that wants it yesterday is actually the side that's actually the idealistic side. And we agree that there is place, there's a place for ideals and idealism. It just seems to me that somehow we need to be able to combine the idealism with a little bit of realism somewhere. And for the realism, it's quite important to understand that we're standing on a very unusual landscape. This is a landscape involving governments or uh, states and private actors like corporations. And these are not just any corporations. We're talking all corporations. So number-wise, they outnumber us all. And also power-wise, I think they probably carry a little bit more than we do. But that's not all. Over the years, via commercial law, via corporate law, via consumer protection, or some other forms of law, we have granted these corporations some privileges. Or in certain cases, we've granted them some rights. And what we're proposing is to try and take some of these privileges away, or at least amending them, I think, for purposes of 
fairness. Maybe some due process is quite important. But more interesting is that the landscape is very unstable. The landscape we stand on is so incredibly unstable. If we excessively agitate it, it will collapse. And we have to be very careful. But that's not all. I think we also have to be able to appreciate what we've got. By all means, we should make progress, but we must be able to appreciate the value of what we have in our hands, in this case, the GPs. And it does concern me sometimes when we talk the GPs down, either because they're soft law or they're not enough or they're as Sheldon phrase, which actually caused me a little bit of concerns that um, there's time is not on the side of the GPs. I, mean, I think we're talking down the GPs and we really have to be a little bit more um, sort of upbeat about what we've got and how we want to use it. Uh, uh, in that sense. But also, we also have to bear in mind that GPs are not just a sudden creation. They're based, and according to John Ruggie, and I agree with him, they're based on existing treaties. We know where they've come from, and we know that they mean a lot already. So if we're going to talk down the GPs, you might as well start talking down the entire human rights regime, uh, and that will fail, and that won't be uh, uh, particularly important. And if they're based on existing law, then it means that the obligations, particularly for states, are already well known. So we're not asking them to do anything in particular. But what we will then be asking, or what I gather we're asking for, is some kind of change on where corporations sit. That is fair enough. But let's be very careful not to ask for a focus on the very large corporations, because we would also like the small and medium-sized enterprises to bear in mind what we are asking everybody else to do. In a very recent attempt to sort of um, uh, be a good parent, I sat down and watched a movie with my son, thought was very good, it's called a Selfish Giant, and I recommend it uh, to everybody, involving a, a small scrap dealer who really uses children to collect his scrap. And it distracts me that if we're going to have a treaty tomorrow, how do we apply the treaty to the guy at the end of an alleyway on a business a park somewhere in the far corners of the north, and I say north not because that's, but that's where the film is based, and let him understand that a treaty has some implications for him. So we tend to almost very quickly imagine that the treaty will only apply to the transnational corporations, and I think that's one of those difficulties we need to bear in mind. Now, I think it is a Chinese saying, but also there is an African saying that says, if you really need to take a journey of a thousand miles, you need to take a few steps. But to take the first steps, you need to assess whether your own feet are capable of taking the very first step. And I think our own feet are the GPs. We ought to be able to be sure that they are incapable of taking the, the journey before we decide not to take it or not to look much further. It therefore strikes me that if we're really are going to go forward, we're going to have to be a little bit more creative, a little bit more strategic. And to be strategic and creative, I think the first step is to ask how the GPs can actually be used in a very complementary way with any new proposals for a treaty or anything else. But above everything else, I think we are right on, or we are on the right path to be talking about it. And that seems to me the very first step forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so let's take these three questions, and I'm sure then uh, afterwards is the debate is going to... Uh, get more animated. Go ahead, please. My name is Lee Payne. I'm, um, I'm at Oxford University. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about compliance with, and treaty compliance. It surprised me that in the skeptics' view that they didn't raise the issue of non-compliance with treaties. But also for the proponents, I think that the argument about expressive nature of law is an important one, but why don't you think the norms, the guiding principles themselves, are already part of an expressive and normative approach uh, to law? The second, well, maybe this is a third question. <laughs> I wondered if you could tell some of us about the treaty proposed by the Ecuadorians so that we could hear your reaction to that. It's not going anywhere, but it, you know your, your view of that, whether it is the right kind of law, the kind of segmentation that you mentioned. I'll start. Uh, the The treaty is, as I understand, has not been defined by Ecuador. It's a simple call for a treaty. We have Ecuador a representative here who can correct me if that's not right. But the idea is that um, the discussion should proceed, and then in the course of a collaborative process, the intergovernmental working group they're proposing would define the issues of what businesses are covered, although they have only called call for transnational businesses. And I happen to also strongly agree um, with Nadia and those who've said that it's got to be all businesses. You know, you've got small businesses, or like Michael Addo just said, 
you know, that can do enormous damage, the radio stations in Rwanda, for example. Um, on the issue of compliance, that's a huge uh, and valid question, you know. The, and yet there are issues that transcend this particular context that need to be addressed. Uh, you know, the ILO conventions, the human rights treaties aren't, um, aren't effective enough, and the empirical literature is saying we know that uh, these treaties that help the most help at the mainly for the middling states or the states that really need a, a little boost, the ones that are the merely PR worst abusers sign on for no reason, and then the developed states with good civil society rule of law, they really don't need them because they're doing a good job already. And yet they've also found, as with Beth Simmons' great book on this, that when there's mobilization, as there is on this issue, and I don't think we should underestimate how much has changed, there's mobilization among civil society. That means NGOs and unions. It also means businesses. And I think a lot of businesses with the guiding principles and all the other soft law standards are really starting to take this on. It's becoming okay again you know, to get beyond homo economicus and ask how our actions impact others. Um, so that would be how I would start to answer your question. Is there anyone here? I'm happy to come back on the uh, question of compliance or non-compliance. Um, I, th I think, um, g given the lack of time, there wasn't the opportunity to talk about every aspect. But I, I, I see it as part of the, the imperfections of the of, of the existing system. Um, and no one is saying that um, through the <clears throat> hundreds of treaties that exist, that there is uniform ratification, that there is uniform um, um, incorporation of those um, treaty rights into national legislative programs. No one is saying that there is uniform compliance. No one is saying that the processes for um, for ensuring enforcement are particularly uh, good. In fact, that's one of the one of the difficulties and one of the other big challenges for the international system at the moment is is the difficulty of enforcement. So, yeah, there was much more that I could have added, but time prevented. Um, Mary Futter, University of Nottingham, um, Business, Trade and Human Rights Unit in the Human Rights Law Centre. Um, I have a, a particular issue with the treaty approach. I think it's the wrong approach. Um, ten days ago I was at the Foreign Office and we were looking at investor state <coughs> dispute settlement and where that's heading. And basically the idea there is the majority of the room was saying, well, we should be looking back at local remedies and looking at courts and uh, tribunals within existing um, state structures to try and deal with investor claims so that we can take on board issues like human rights and other social issues. Um, and that's where I think we should be going. I think the guiding principles give us a normative framework. They give us guidance. That's the whole point of it. Um, but they help us to, they're like waypoints, markers, to show states what they should be doing. And I think you can do a lot more within domestic law and extraterritorially. I think that option has to be explored too. And right now the European Union is, is negotiating extensively with Canada, with the United States, with the TTIP, and putting in... Um, framing human rights obligations into those treaties, I think we need to be a lot more creative and it isn't have, I think hell will freeze over or Antarctica will refreeze before we have a treaty on business. So there we go. Thank you. Thank you. There was a second, yeah. Louise Winstanley from AB Columbia. Um, I, w I was quite interested in the discussion that you began about the ICC and regional mechanisms. Um, and how we might employ some of those, because I really think that enforcement is is a major issue, and I think that we found we 've always known that in terms of human rights, where impunity exists so so the crimes continue, and really, where we want to get to is a situation of prevention, and so therefore, I think we need remedies that really have teeth um, and I did notice that um, when the guiding principles came in in the whole discussion beforehand when Ruggy visited various countries, he visited the UK and commended the UK on the legal aid bill that we, on the legal aid that we had at the time. And then they introduced the legal aid bill and we took a step backwards. So the other debate that really interests me is how, if we continue to pursue voluntary mechanisms, might we be undermining what already exists or at least not putting enough um, force behind trying to ensure that there are legal mechanisms. Thank you. The third question. 
Hi, I'm Laura Bletcher from per Proxy Advisor. Um, I'm not sure to what extent this is a concern. I would appreciate your feedback, but at domestic law, there's been a lot of concern about um, corporate personhood and perpetuating this notion of corporations as people. And I'm wondering what the risk is in you know, trying to devise a treaty of perpetuating this um, this concept at international law, and um, or are we kind of past the point of no return on? Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to ask now the panel to respond to these three questions. So we have the comment on the um, mechanism to resolve investment disputes and where there is a good idea to bring it back to local remedies. Uh, the second one is about discussion a little bit further on the possibilities to use some existing mechanisms like the ICC and the um, problem of probably uh, focusing on voluntary mechanisms and undermining what already exists. And then the third question about the risk to perpetuate the concept of corporate. Yeah, I, I could um, just respond to the third question, I think. Um, it's, it's a good example, I think, of the, the steps that a treaty could take that may be beyond the reach of a national system. Uh, and the steps that could be taken could well be coming back on the classic separation between companies and corporate groups, um, rendering parent companies more responsible than they are at the moment, going further even than our common law developments are taking us, but addressing any uh, – well, and, and doing that nevertheless in a way that also allows some room for separate legal personality – but not when you've got very serious damage, raising human rights concerns, etc. cetera. Um, problem, can you really bank on getting that through unilaterally? Further problem, well, we'll do it if our competitors do it. How do we know they're going to do it? Classic reason for having a treaty. And that would be an example, it seems to me, of where you could move. Oh. Nadia. Yeah, I just want to say something about your point about domestic mechanisms. Um, I think, you know, and the idea of reinforcing them and that maybe that, that's the way forward. Uh, very simple point. I don't think we need an international treaty for states to reinforce their domestic mechanisms. Um, I think they can do that. They have the leeway to do it. They could do it. They choose not to do it. And I don't think having a treaty, pushing for a treaty, would change that reality, which is a complex reality linked to, to domestic issues. What it would do is perhaps shame some of them in actually moving forward. And in that sense, I share what Sheldon has just said, which is we'll do it if the competitors do it sort of, sort of attitude. But on something that specific, and we all know the implications of what it means to open your courts more. It means legal aid, it means a variety of, of, of very uh, complex things to be done at the domestic system. Whether having a treaty that says reinforce your mechanisms will actually bring about all these consequences on the ground uh, and, and all the, 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 the very uh, complex um, bits that that involves, I, I'm I'm really a skeptic. Yes, yes, please. Just to come back on the question about <clears throat> whether voluntary mechanisms undermine the uh, legal mechanisms, um, it does seem to me that that's rather what's happening regarding the UK's position at the moment. And from what <clears throat> Professor Cassell said about their stance at the um, recent UN meetings, if they are seemingly suggesting that their energy needs to be put into the non-binding mechanisms, that would seem to suggest that that's where they're... That's to the exclusion, I would suggest, um, of putting their energy into binding mechanisms. So therefore, in that sense, you already have an example of where the, volunta the vol voluntary principles are being effectively pushing out the way the prospect of further work and further energy being devoted to, to binding, um, binding mechanisms. Chief, do you want to? Yeah, I've just got a couple of questions. Or I, I'm, I'm not sure, Mary, that the idea of enhanced domestic remedies and enforcement couldn't really be helped by the right treaty, assuming the big if that we could get the political consensus. A lot of treaties start small, like the Geneva Conventions, you know, a dozen or so states – 
and then grow over time to become parts customary international law. Um, on the guiding principles, you know, they had the benefit of one intelligent, you know, very, very intelligent uh, guiding perspective, John Ruggie. But the treaty could focus not on a, a world court or more politically unrealistic things. It could focus on the state duty to protect because the states right now may not have the focus on what the implications even of the guiding principles are. They could focus in on giving cooperation and technical assistance to states to enhance, you know, what's worked, take the tort and civil, uh, civil law and criminal law remedies. They could educate through a multi-year process that would take a long time, you know, what has worked. And I think if we can achieve that, if we could frame it so we manage the downside risk, uh, arguably it would be worthwhile. You could have, uh, you know, uh, an innovative treaty body that would learn from some of the more recent experiences with field visits and more active engagement and cooperative consultation, you know, enhancing corporate culture, as and in a lot of recent treaties. I don't think focusing on gross abuses would be the only way to go. I think that most business human rights violations would then be excluded if you just focus on gross abuses. Plus, there's a definitional problem there. Um, on the personhood question, I'm, a, I'm not sure. I, I would like to think it's not, but I'm afraid the jury may be out on that because a lot of international treaties, a lot of court decisions and regional courts, and certainly Citizens United in the U.S. have accepted that corporations of, corporations of purpose, persons. That happened a long time ago with a, a law meant to you know, outlaw slavery in the U.S. is now used for corporates' rights to free speech by giving money and influencing government. So it's very problematic, but rights aren't absolute. And you can say, you know, rights, certain rights trump other rights. And, you know, we're going to circumscribe your rights if, if they're used to violate other rights. Or, um, but, you know, right now the anti-corruption treaty, a lot of treaties talk about legal persons. And I think if your intent is to have an actual proper balance and, you know, make progress in this area, I think that's going to be okay. I'm Jill Shankleman. I work with a lot of companies on social impacts, human rights. Um, I fear there is absolutely no doubt that... A really strong push for a treaty would suck all of the energy out of uh, voluntary action. Uh, at the moment, efforts in corporations to really understand and address human rights issues are, are largely sitting with the corporate responsibility people who are the kind of voice inside the corporations. As soon as there's a serious move towards a treaty, it will go straight to general counsel and it will be squashed. Uh, and we can see that in some of the response to Dodd-Frank and so on. What I think is the mechanism we should really be looking at, uh, and it's a regional one, is strength, strengthening the uh, OECD guidelines. Because there is some mechanism in every country for enforcing them. They're very different in their traction, in how good they are, but there is something in place which could be built on, and I do see and have had direct experience of that affecting that sort of middle tier of companies uh, who wouldn't you know, who aren't part of the human rights discussion, but it starts influencing their behavior when they have action taken against them, and it starts <coughs> affecting peers in the same. So strengthen the OECD guidelines as an, as an interim step. Hi, my name is Aul. Um, I agree that um, I think in the last 50 or so years, um, international human rights uh, regimes and, and treaties have uh, provided individuals and groups with a certain kind of ethical framework, the normative language with which people can articulate their grievances against the states, against power, and so on and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's important to be reminded that human rights also played an important role in legitimizing power, in legitimizing the states. They have this normalizing, disciplining power in the sense of preventing people from making more radical demands against the state. So the question is, if most of the proponents are not really sure about the possibility of compliance, isn't there a risk of actually legitimizing corporations rather than holding them accountable? Because there are parts of the country, remember, parts of certain, certain parts of the world where the mere fact of signing a treaty or ratifying a treaty is actually used to submerge certain human rights claims because that in of itself is seen as doing something and therefore presented as a reason for not doing more. Thank you. Thank you. The third question. Hi, Tara Van Ho with the Essex Business and Human Rights Project. Um, I wanted to start with what Chris started with, which is what's the difference between the, between the norms and now in terms of why there could be a binding treaty or why things are different. 
And there are three things that are actually different now, and they're from the UN Guiding Principles. The sphere of influence is out. We no longer look for a delineation of rights. <coughs> and I wrote the third one down, sorry. Oh, yeah. We no longer expect respect, protect, and fulfill, but just respect. And so this raises my question for Chris and Nadia, principally, uh, which is why do we need to delineate the rights within a treaty for businesses? Why don't we just make reference then to the home and host state's obligations, which would then also take account of this difference between transnational corporations and small and medium-sized corporations. Small and medium-sized corporations may only have to adhere to one set of treaties, whereas a large multinational corporation like Shell would have to adhere to a much broader number of treaties. Thank you. So we have comment on the treaty that's sucking ener energy for the implementation of the guardian principles, role of OECD guidelines and the NCPs, the question of the risk of legitimizing corporations, and then your question about um, the, uh, not why not referring to the home and host state's obligation directly for Nadia and Chris, I think. So if you want to start probably with the last question. <clears throat> I'll start. Nadia may want to add, add, add to what I say. Um, look, I, I, I hope that I'm wrong. You, you know, I, I'm not fundamentally objecting to the idea of there being a treaty. I'm just not convinced that it's possible to get a good one. And that's what um, Chip has said. Let's get a good treaty, and I'm not convinced we can get a good one. If some of the objections that were raised at the time that the norms were presented have fallen away, then hurrah. Um, but I'm still, given what we understand of the way in which um, companies and states indeed are responding to the current calls for a treaty, I'm not convinced that there's been a sea change of opinion uh, amongst either states or companies, that, that maybe there's different reasons that they might be arguing against the, 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 the set of norms, if you like. But, but I'm not convinced that they fundamentally changed their minds about the idea. Yeah, I completely agree with that. There's also one thing that you mentioned that I think w would even add a layer of complexity is differentiating between the home state and the host state obligations. Not all states, but many states are both home and host states. And it seems very complicated to me to start distinguishing between obligations depending on depending on that. I, I, I don't, well, maybe I misunderstood your question, but I, I don't really see how you could practically, in a treaty which is necessarily limited in, in space and and, and number of words, uh, how you could actually spell out differentiated obligations based on the capacity of the state at a special point and, and with regards to a special situation. But maybe we can talk later. <laughs> Well, I think just on the on the issue our colleague in the back raised about the the, the risk of, as you put it, uh, legitimizing what um, a kind of power that may well fall short, um, but is able to conceal it, as it were. And and I think if we're to appreciate what is enraging people who are disappointed by the promises of the guiding principles, it's in that domain. And um, as lawyers, the, the, the touchstone may well be, um, is the formal adoption of some of these rights followed through with the kind of detail that really makes it a human right? Now, let me give you one example. Um, about a year ago, I was discussing with corporate counsel from a large multinational who was proud of the fact that his company had adopted ILO standards. He said, that's excellent. Um, now, that includes, he said very proudly, the standards on freedom of association. Fine. Then I asked, does that mean you do follow what the ILO says freedom of association means via their committee that interprets that convention regularly? Silence. He wasn't at all happy with that idea. Now, that kind of gap between the human, rec human rights recognizable way of of, of acknowledging freedom association and what we were seeing there is something we have to worry about and I think this is not just an abstract problem it's a problem people confront when they see and their, their advocates see they're displaced from their property they're losing their jobs etc by companies formally adhering to these norms 
uh, formally subscribing to what the general the guiding principles are saying they must do, but interpreting them in a way that does fall short, and that that's what is a problem. Yeah. Chief, if you want to. Well, sure. I think that the um, the critique about liberalism in general, rights in particular, and corporations, um, you know, there is a, a history of international law in general which was used as a mask for power, without a doubt. You know, it started as basically legitimating investment and exploitation of resources and colonialism. Grotius himself was not only an advocate of freedom of the, the seas and, and peace and international law, but he was a commercial lawyer for the East India Company a long time ago. So, you know, we, we shouldn't forget that these things are <laughs> they're mixed up. But I think nowadays, you know, corporations as a realistic matter are here to stay for the foreseeable future. Rights, fortunately, are here to stay. Let's use them and, you know, use them correctly. On the, um, you know, the, the, the topic of, uh, well, I, I'll stop there. I'll reserve my okay. mind. <laughs> you want a little bit of time, so. I, I think it's interesting that Chris and I ultimately agree on the domestic remedies. You could have a treaty that, um, that focuses just on the national contact points, for example, and beefing them up. The OECD starts with, you know, clearer rules, stronger enforcement mechanisms just for the NCP. But we don't know what the content will be for this treaty discussion until it's happened. And the discussions are happening whether we in this room agree or not. So I think it's very important to try to shape the discussions, to have frameworks in terms of reference, to try to get the good treaty. I mean, this is the process. And the guiding principles are not going to be the only thing going. It's like, you know, whether um, movies would be, um, you know, out, di outdated by the Internet and, and whether radio and TV would have persisted, you know, before them. The OECD convention, the OECD guidelines, the NCPs, the other soft law standards, the UN Global Compact, the guiding principles, they each have their role to play, and they will coexist so long as they're having a value-added role. The question is right now whether there's additional value to trying to frame the discussion and do some good for business and human rights by teaching the businesses what they mean in context, the way the norms tried to do. You could either take the specific approach of delineating the rights, or you could have a general, elegant, simple duty to respect that cuts across all these legal domains. I kind of like that. I'm torn as to which approach would be best. But for the treaty to really add value, I think it's got to be somewhat specific. And in the criminal context, it must be specific in order to provide, you know, the international human rights requirement of due process under law, notice, and so forth. Uh, Roger Alford with Notre Dame Law School. I have a question for Chip. Uh, we talked about this earlier, but... One analogy would be the OECD Convention Against Bribery, and that's sort of a capital exporting initiative that starts from one end and moves down. The other option would be the Landmine Convention and the sort of um, uh, Ottawa process that starts from where the victims were, and then it moves upward, uh, right? And so one possibility would be to think about not a global or not a regional treaty, but a victim-oriented Ottawa process in which you focus on the individual countries that are most in need and see if those collections of countries could agree on some sort of treaty. And I would imagine that you would get then uh, a long way toward protecting victims in these most vulnerable places. So I'm wondering if anyone has a thought about the Landmines Convention or the Ottawa process as a way to sort of solve this question of British opposition or American opposition or multinational opposition. Good evening. My name is Mark Hodge from the Global Business Initiative on Human Rights. Uh, thank you for the, for the discussion. Um, uh, I guess I wanted to check uh, were a few things. Uh, one is I've heard this notion that, you know, yes, we're on a, in the international legal making process. We start from softer norms and we move up, and UDHR was mentioned as one example. <clears throat> is there agreement or... Should there be reinforcement, therefore, that the guiding principles are the equivalent of the UDHR in this process? Or, as I'm hearing people, I think rather sloppishly, honestly, say the GPs don't deliver, they're not, they're not enough, they're not, they're not good enough. Or are we saying they are the equivalent of the UDHR in this process, and from there we build? That's a question I have. Um, privacy, internet governance is my second question. Would we advocate and support that the question of regulating and uh, defining privacy rights in the internet sphere is something we now would like to entrust into an intergovernmental process that governments will lead and negotiate. Because in that space, we're fighting against state, states taking action and we're calling on corporate actors 
to meet their corporate responsibility to respect. Um, is that just a unique example, or are there other examples where uh, we might be misplaced in our rationale as to where protection is going to come from? And my last question, I guess, is this a bit debate was wonderful, um, and that the 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 intelligent, the dialectical nature of the conversation was perfect. Um, I have skepticism as to whether next month in the context of the Human Rights Council discussions, the quality of dialogue will be this high. <laughs> Which brings to an, uh, the elephant in the room. When is this driven by this type of dialogue and when is it driven by political motivations? And who is going to start calling out what we should be driven by? Whether that's from a corporate perspective that are being driven by political motivations or states driven by political motivations, who will start calling that out? Because surely that's what's getting in the way of the ability to really make the progress and have this dialogue. And, and will any of you call that out or do any of you think that's irrelevant? And do you think we are just in a sort of technical discussion here? And can anyone shed light on politics? I'll say very quickly about whether the UN guiding principles are the equivalent of the Universal Declaration. I really don't think so. <laughs> I mean, the, it, it, in any shape or form, I think, can we compare uh, the two um, the two instruments? Obviously, I, I know, I, I hear what you're trying to say, I know. Um, but there's, there's one thing that, that I want to add on that, just using your question as an excuse, really, is that we've heard before in one of the questions that the guiding principles are voluntary. I disagree with that, and I don't think they were meant to be voluntary. The alternative is not having a binding treaty or leaving everything out as, as, as voluntary uh, guidance. This, this, these are not the alternatives. There's a variety of things that can be done in between, and I do think the guiding principles very clearly are not meant to be voluntary. They're meant to be, as John Ruggie explained, at least the responsibility to respect is meant to be a social expectation, which is not the same thing as do what you like. Um, and in, in that sense, I think they are close to the UDHR, actually, without having, of course, the breadth and, and, and everything that comes with the declaration. So thank you for the question, because that allowed me to make that point. Uh, in terms of the political motivations behind each of the... Uh, each of the um, of, of the positions, at least in the UN, at the UN level and, and, and state positions, I don't know whether it, sh it matters that much. I mean, I hear the concern, and I am concerned about that as well, actually, about what's behind opposition and what's behind support and what's behind everything in between. I, maybe I'm being naive on that, but I'm not too sure that's really a question which is that central bearing in mind that, that what matters would be the result and not necessarily why people did it, during a parallel with the International Criminal Court um, and the, the establishment of the International Criminal Court, I am sure that the countries that participated in the negotiations and at the end of the day the countries that signed the treaty in Rome and those that adhered later, I don't think they all shared the same motivations. At the end of the day, I don't think it, it matters that much. But it is a point that I've been thinking about, just don't know what to do about it. But, yeah. Just very quick. Yeah, just a very quick comment think. because the, the comment over here is exactly really the, the kind of vision that I that I was trying to enunciate when I was talking earlier. The idea of something coming from 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 the, those states which are fully committed to the idea, and that the idea that they might be able to work together to produce something that was a little bit more coherent than perhaps we have now. Right. Yeah. I mean, just to respond to some some of the, the points raised, um, the claim that. Um, we're saying, or at least you take perhaps us as saying, that the UN uh, guiding principles are not delivering and therefore a treaty is necessary, I think is a little overdrawn. Uh, it, it is the case that I think uh, standing as they do on their own is not enough for the reasons we've given uh, the framework of a treaty makes a lot of sense. Um, it throws the light, though, on precisely what kind of instrument the guiding principles are. And the uh, Universal Declaration may be one example, but I thought actually Ruggie hit it on the head when he, in Geneva one meeting, said this is a kind of constitution. Now, of course, that's a kind of very ambitious claim, but what he meant is this is full of essentially very often vague and loaded terms, 
but within these you can develop something far more concrete and far more if able to cope with a variety of situations. Um, a treaty would have a similar kind of function for reasons we've gone into. It may complement that quasi-constitutional role. As for politics, um, you put your finger on a dilemma, I think, that the World Bank has faced when it's tried to uh, try to grapple with the fact that it, any taking on board of human rights buys into politics in ways that its charter says it can't do, its articles say it can't do. And yet the drift of consensus is beginning to emerge that yes, there's a sub-area of politics which is undeniably there when a, a, a human rights claim is made and commitment and argument begins. It's political in the sense that it divides people, it divides the polity, as it were, along recognizable lines. I don't think you can get away from that. Human rights is political in that limited sense, but it doesn't take you the full range of things that divide people. So politics is there. Yeah. I, I thought the, the questions were so much more intelligent than the ones I would ask, so thank you very much for that. Um, so now we come to the closing remarks from the two principal uh, speakers. I'd like to uh, ask Chris first and then finish with uh, Chip, if I may. I don't think that the choice that Professor Cassell posed for us at the beginning between a treaty and the guiding principles is the right choice. I think the choice is whether we're in favour or against enforceable rights for victims of human rights abuses by transnational corporations and other companies. In this context, and I, this refers to the question that was raised earlier, the, the guiding principles can be a distraction. They're certainly a distraction if some companies and governments see them as an alternative to enforceable rights, as would increasingly appear to me to be the case. Why has the take-up of the guiding principles been swift and widespread? I think it's probably to do with the fact that they're voluntary, and businesses can see the propaganda value in referring to them with no major downsides of signing up. Those governments, generally friendly to companies, can require compliance with the guiding principles without fear of up upsetting big business, and we think again of the UK's example recently, a fairly toothless plan for implementation of the guiding principles and a very, very early statement that they're opposed to the treaty. And on the other hand, those less friendly to companies can argue that the guiding principles are a step on the road to an eventual treaty on the subject. Everyone's a winner. No one can object. Unless, of course, you favour accountability and redress over propaganda and appearances. It's the brave individuals, NGOs and claimant lawyers around the world who are left at the vanguard, battling away with the existing patchwork of rights, whilst many companies and governments spend their energies discussing voluntary mechanisms. In this sense, the guiding principles could be said even to be part of the problem. They contribute to the use of a neat and attractive PR fig leaf over ugly human rights abuses. For all that the guiding principles may have put human rights on the agenda, and for that I commend them, that agenda remains vain and weak. And it will be some time before the patchwork of existing enforceable domestic and extraterritorial obligations of TNCs, transnational corporations, provides a solid enough foundation for a single global set of enforceable rights in this area. So please, let's work together towards binding and enforceable rights and remedies in this area. But let's not fool ourselves into thinking that a single treaty at this stage is likely to achieve that. My heart says yes to a treaty, but my head says no. Thank you. And I actually don't have a tremendous amount to add, and I won't be as eloquent as, as Chris just was, but I, I find that we've kind of come full circle. We're disagreeing about the usefulness of the guiding principles. I think they're far more significant and helpful than a mere fig leaf for propaganda. Um, and I also think that it, it, we're going to have a pluralistic set of norms and a pluralistic set of enforcement standards for a long time. One thing is sure, the guiding principles do not as BP said in its 2010 sustainability report, 
the same year of the Gulf oil spill, they do not represent laying to rest a long-standing international debate about whether mandatory norms are required. <laughs> That's clearly. Whether we're going to have them at the domestic national level or the regional level, or we'll beef them up at the global level, is an open question, and we've got to do all these things. You know, it's not an either or. John Ruggie is absolutely right about that. This isn't, it's a false dichotomy. The guiding principles themselves, if you read them closely, You'll, you'll see that he took on board, not to the extent that I would have fully liked, but he took on board the, the, the comments of a lot of international law and human rights scholars, including um, empirically based research that all businesses can affect all human rights. And he also took on board that you know, businesses right now have hard law duties under humanitarian law and under criminal law in, in order not to violate human rights. Despite what people say about the guiding principles, therefore, if you read them closely, you will see, if you read them liberally and with progressive intent, uh, looking for the legal aspects, you'll see that they're certainly not voluntary. You know, these duties are interrelated, the state duty to protect. The ILO conventions, for example, you can read them different ways. The states are required to do things like stop discrimination, ensure occupational safety and health, pay a fair wage, or one that approaches an adequate standard of living, which relates to the human rights regime. But that obligation on states wouldn't have any meaning if in common sense, if not in formal law, the corporations didn't have ob obligations to do that, right? That's more of a philosophical than a legal argument. But the state duty protect is there. The standards are there. But as a practical matter, you know, the businesses are not aware of what their content is. The states aren't aware of what the content is. And so whether it's a new soft law declaration or whether it's a, a, you know, something elaborating the guiding principles and the, the business duty to respect in more detail. You know, principle 23 says that in cases of gross human rights abuses, businesses should treat that as a legal compliance matter. They recognize that that's hard law. And as I've said, John Ruggie was informed by the idea that this is, you know, it's, it's a common universal obligations that in theory, corporations need to be responsible for their harms, need to be liable for them all around the world. We need to focus on implementation and enforcement. Now I'm going to answer some of the questions. And, and, and the first question um, that Professor Roger Alford asked is whether we can do something like the Landmines Treaty, where Canada was going to go for this no matter what, and it worked. And that's what happened also in the anti-corruption context. The U.S. had its FCPA, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, domestic law, and we need more of that in this area. And then it expanded to the OECD countries, regional mechanisms, you know, the, uh, the different regions enacted their anti-corruption laws, and then the U.N. Convention. And so it can operate either way. The bottom-up approach of state law and Ecuador could implement in its investment treaty right now. The new one does not reference the, the FP, FPIC, Free Prior Informed Consent Principle. It doesn't commit the state to uh, comply with human rights obligations. It should do that. And so, by the way, should the developed countries. You know, it's a, it's a myth that I, I always get upset about that people think these human rights problems, forced labor, child labor, don't exist in countries like my own, the United States. Of course they do at a very significant level you know, tomato farmers and not getting a living wage and their new innovative mechanisms to try to deal with that. We need all the, th these problems are so wicked, complex, and persistent, we need all the help we can get. You know, Lord knows, this isn't going to go away any soon. We're not going to have utopia on earth and human rights respected by businesses and everyone else. In response to Mark Hodges' question about whether the, um, you know, the guiding principles should, or whether this area could benefit from the privacy approach of business duties, yes, they can. We do need to not only beef up the state duty to protect. I would agree that's the most important thing. States have the primary responsibility to enforce human rights. But we need to educate businesses and states need to move toward another approach that you could do with a treaty, which is to gradually build consensus around recognizing that businesses need direct obligations to respect human rights. That should not be an issue given the economic realities anymore. Um, so I do think that the guiding principles are not the universal declaration of human rights, but I also think we don't need another soft law instrument in this area. We need to work on beefing up the laws that exist and most importantly, yes, beefing up enforcement and access to remedy. And a, a treaty could help with that. But we don't want to wait for a treaty. We don't want to wait for perfect implementation of the guiding principles for doing anything. We need to proceed on all fronts. Um, so I, I guess the final thing I'll say is that, you know, uh, many business and human rights violations happen because of a failure of imagination. The executives distance from the developed country situation or their emotional distance, their lack of empathy from feeling how other people will be affected by their actions. 
I hope that we don't have the same failure of imagination to think that we should at least talk about a hard law treaty as we are also simultaneously proceeding implementation of the guiding principles with full force and vigor, national act action plans, and everything that will be in John, the spirit of John Ruggie's principled pragmatism, what really makes a difference for human rights victims on the ground. Thank you. It just remains for me to say a couple of words. The first one is that I think, you know, Michael Lano said it, uh, that we should, this is the start of the debate, it's the start of the discussion on these issues, and it's very important that we hold those, uh, these ideas open for a good while yet. I think the, the panel has been exemplary in, in showing how to avoid unnecessary polarisation while at the same time expressing clear views that allow us to move the debate forward. Um, we will continue this debate. Notre Dame and, uh, and the Resource Centre are also committed to doing more uh, work like this together. You'll also have seen that we're videoing, videoing the whole piece. If you didn't want your question uh, uh, videoed, tough luck. No, you can come and see that. <laughs> the, uh, but the point is that the video will be up very soon on the Resource Centre website. We also have a special section on this whole issue of the International Binding Treaty with contribu two contributions from John Ruggie, but also from Surya Deva and a number of the speakers uh, today, including Nadia. Uh, so all those pieces are up there for you if, if you want to take these uh, debates further in your own fields. I think it's first of all then for me to thank you as an audience again for giving up your uh, spring evening uh, to be with us. There's a huge vote of thanks uh, to Doug Cassells who's uh, worked tirelessly uh, with us to uh, make this really come alive. Also Sam Wannell, our uh, administrator, who's done a phenomenal job in, uh, in doing a lot of the logistics around the, the evening with the staff of, of, of Notre Dame, who've also made a huge contribution. Mauricio is also, Lazala has also been very much at the forefront of the thinking around it. And finally, of course, I'd like to uh, ask you once again to join me in thanking the panel for what I think has been an extraordinary evening. Thank you. <laughs>